Hey everyone, welcome to episode 11 of Let's Consider Luke. It's 4.47 a.m. Eastern Standard, 10.10, 10, 2021 years. Uh, yeah. Anyways, I gotta tell you, I, I don't even want to make this. I, I, I don't even want to, I, here's the problem. Not, not that I don't want to do it. I don't want to deal with the fact that there are this many disparities <laughs> in the Gospels, you know, between, between Luke and Matthew. Or that it's gone this long or that I've gone this long. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm 46 years old. Now, I've... I have been reading books about the Bible and Christianity for decades. I would suggest that one of the main reasons I never became truly committed and serious about all of this is in part because there is such a lack of honesty and transparency about these things in the Christian and church establishment. Um... <laughs> And that's not even factoring in, of course, the uh, Jewish and Judeo-Christian establishment, which is just nothing but founded on oh, horrible lies. I would like not to have so much <laughs> that there is uh, to be gone over, because there is so much. I would like that to not be a thing, but it is a thing. An entire book could be written, maybe it should be written, about the differences between just Luke and Matthew. And I have a strong suspicion, based on all of the times that I, I've actually cross-referenced Luke to the other Gospel accounts, Mark and John, that a very exhaustive book should be written concerning all of the disparities between the Gospels, and perhaps weighing which of them has the, the most credit that lines up the most with what we find uh, conceptually and just factually in the Old Testament. I think that would be very worthwhile. Certainly not something I'm going to do anytime very soon, because I have a lot of other things in the works. But it's that bad. I was kind of hoping the, uh, the Let's Consider Luke would be just a few. <laughs> I really did. I was, I was so optimistic. <laughs> And I got, I, just, I have to laugh because it's just so amazing. And um, there are a lot of Christian channels. And so, when I say Christian, I just mean they got that label on there. I don't know what they are, you know. That um, they profess to, to know and they want to teach you. They want to teach you the Bible, and how to live, and how to think. And none of them are talking about these problems. None of them are going to prepare you for a, a very talented, very smart person to come along who is going to start showing you these problems. In fact, you know, a lot of them, the like the leading scholars that I know of in, in popular Christendom today, 
they will actually spend their time writing books or doing talks when they do address this, when they do address this, because they don't often. Where they're more of like an exercise of glossing over these problems than truly addressing them. And they don't address all of them. And I would say, you know, a real smart guy who was a, a critic, let's say that he believed or he was just working for the people who want us to not believe any of this, our history. He could come along and make a really strong case just for the fact, just little things that I've pointed out as we've gone. The disparities in where indeed he was supposed to be locationally. As far as, okay, well, this account says that he went to Jerusalem three times over this course of time, but this account actually says he went four times over this course of time. This account says that once he gets to Jerusalem, he only goes to this or that other place. This account says that when he gets to Jerusalem, he goes to another place, which is actually very far away, or should be quite far away. They could just start focusing on those things, and they could tear this up. They could tear this up, and they would have the people who don't really understand that the the people whose um authorities have been telling them from the earliest age um, things like that the bible is inerrant uh, there's no error in the bible there's no error there are people who you know teach king james onlyism that there's no error in that that I'll put it as they do, that God himself inspired uh, that translation and that it's inerrant. And all you have to do is, is look at certain things and say, if that's the case, you have two Gospels here, and for instance, one Gospel says that he gave this sermon, says sermon that's called Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 4, like five through seven, on a mountain. It literally says there in Matthew he gave it on a mountain. But when you go to its complementary passage, and it is complementary, we see it as far as the verses, what's being taught there. It says that he did this on a plane, that he literally came down from a mountain and taught on a plane. If it's inerrant, are you telling me that he taught both in a mountain, and at the bottom of a mountain, simultaneously. What would be the response? Well, he taught at a plateau of a mountain. So you see, he came down from a higher place. That's literally where you would have to go. So that's why it's it's important to know these things and to pay attention to them, point them out. Because is it is it better to believe and live and die by a lie? Or is it better to understand that there are problems and and what the problems are and and that all of those problems they don't necessarily mean because there are all of these problems they don't necessarily mean that our faith is in vain they don't mean that the the god of israel um does not exist they do not mean that the scriptures are wholly untrustworthy they don't mean these things, because we point them out that does not mean any of those things. But if we ignore them, and we don't consider them, we don't apply our minds to understanding what the problems are, then 
it's literally a weakness. It's a weakness in our understanding of these things. Um, it's a, it's a weakness perhaps for ourselves or, or let's say our weaker brothers and sisters who may come under attack by those who are very sharp mentally and not know what to do with that. And I'm not saying as far as getting into an argument with somebody, I oftentimes don't get into arguments with people. Um, there are a lot of people that I don't argue with, or at a point I just stop, because it's not my job to argue with someone, or to try to convince someone who has either made up their mind, or just some sort of a degenerate, fit for destruction anyways. And it's not my job to sort out who is who. It's just my job to be as true as I, I possibly can. In every possible way. To do my best like that. That's, that's my job and, and my responsibility. Those other things aren't. So I had to re-record this because there are, there are about four or five, um, Subtitle, like subsection titles. Getting myself some coffee right now because I'm I'm really not going to pause this as I go. Uh, yeah, there are about four or five subsection titles, and at the end, I am in Luke chapter 17. At the end of this is a is a lengthy passage, and it is supposed to be the uh, the parallel or the complementary section of Luke to the Olivet Discourse, which is essentially Matthew 24 and 25, because 25 actually continues along his monologue, pretty much unbroken. And the first one I spent, what I think is just too much time on the, on the earlier verses, so I'm just going to quickly point out some, uh, some oddities to them. Uh, the first one, we'll just go over the... Uh, the, the smaller subtitles. It starts with temptations to sin, goes on to increase our faith, then to unworthy servants, then Jesus cleanses ten lepers, and then finally, the coming of the kingdom. Those are the, t uh, the, the one, two, three, the five that we'll go over, and we'll have to spend a little bit more time on um, number five. I guess instead of uh, nitpicking the fact that these first four verses in the temptation to sin section are, uh, they are out of context a bit, okay? Uh, 17.1 and 17.2 are actually backwards uh, in order in, in the, the way they uh, appear in Matthew. That's not you know, that's not the end of the world. You can have two ideas that are rearranged in their order. You know, like literally you could have two statements. The enemy is coming. Man the gate. Okay, that's two statements. And you could say it like that, or you could say, man the gate. The enemy is coming. Right? You could do that. Of course you could. The problem here is more in the fact that by the time we get to Luke 17, we have a continuation of what seems to be like a, uh, oh, how do I say, it, it, it's sort of this long dissertation that is so erratic. It's so erratic in who's being spoken to. It is so erratic in the subject matter. Like, for instance, what we saw in Luke 16, when Jesus is purported by Luke to have gone from this parable of the unrighteous steward, and I still don't know what he's trying to get at, because if I, if I just read it as it's written, it looks like he's, you know, he's telling people to, to, to make friends with the unrighteous world, which goes absolutely against other teachings of his. 
and it goes against the law and the prophets. So then you have to try to make sense of that. Um, straight on to an odd passage about putting away your wife and becoming an adulterer, which first off doesn't follow what are supposed to be the parallel passages in Matthew. Um, and it's also incomplete, of course. It doesn't have the clause concerning who can put away who and for what charge and who is indeed an adulterer and so on and so forth. And then it goes on from there to that really bizarre passage about the law and the prophets existing until John, which has been used by antinomians a lot. Antinomians are those who are against the law, who teach that the law has been done away with. Um, it's been used by a lot of people that have a lot of different opinions for a lot of things, because it's that uh, strange and hard to pin down and define. And then it goes from that to this account of Lazarus and the rich man. And again, if it's a parable, it's the only parable in which somebody's actually named. The only one uh, out of all the parables attributed to Jesus is the only one where somebody's specifically named. And we don't know if it's a parable or not. And it's certainly a leading section used by those who advocate for an eternal burning torturous torment in hell and it ends uh, very bizarrely it actually ends and then it goes straight on to well, Luke 17 1 then he said to his disciples <laughs> and what's so strange about it is, um, well, sort of the subject matter as we go from that uh, into the next subtitle, Increase Our Faith. <clears throat> because it says, uh, Then he said to his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe, and then in gray italics, unto him, through whom they come! Exclamation point. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Well, which little ones? Because we don't have anywhere in the context that little ones were now around him. We have to assume that, because before this, we have him only talking to Pharisees and his disciples, grown-ups. But, not only does he say that, we're not sure where the little ones come from, he jumps right from there into, in, seven, in Luke 17.3, Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Okay, so he's gone from the subject of these little ones and offending these little ones, talking about children, to your brother offending you and how many times you should forgive your brother. Now, first off, this does actually contradict what he says to Peter in Matthew concerning the forgiveness of your brother. And I personally would like further qualifications of this because of the fact that this idea of forgiveness and forgiveness for certain deeds and who your brother is and the way that we interpret them, the way that it's taught in churchianity today, it it's not very harmonious with a lot of what we see in the Old Testament. The, the idea that when we get to the New Testament, we have a kindler, gentler God. Well, he had time to think about things, I guess. You know, from Matthew, I'm sorry, from Malachi to Matthew, he had a, a, a good spell of time there to just sit and think about how he was doing things. He had a change of heart. That's literally how modern Christianity tends to look at this. <laughs> that's, that's why you get things like dispensations, ideas that, well, at this time he did this, and then that, that didn't work. So uh, he went on and he did this, that didn't work. Uh, so then finally he had this idea of uh, the Jesus, that would work for sure. And then all we need to do to go to heaven forever is uh, we have to believe. Believe. 
And then there's all of these different ideas about believe. Believe what? Believe how? Are there a few things that I can believe and get to heaven? Do I have to believe everything? Do I have to believe even though I see clear problems, disparities between the Gospels? Do I have to believe both of them? Does it matter which Gospel I believe? Or can I just believe in Jesus? Do I have to believe in the historical Jesus as secular history says that he existed? Or can I just believe in the Bible Jesus? Do you see how insane it all is? I want to know that I'm the only one who... I, I want to know that I'm not the only one who sees how insane it all is. So he's talking about children. This is Luke. He's talking about children for two verses. Then he talks about your brother offending you. Who's your brother? Well, we need to establish that too, and that's not qualified here. But maybe we could find that out better if we just did a word study. Okay, we'll leave it at that. But then he goes on after two verses concerning your brother, changing the subject. Boom, boom. Then Luke 17, 5, and the apostles said unto the Lord, the disciples, the apostles. So I guess we're just talking about the inner 12. Said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said... Uh, so what are, what are we talking about? Are we talking about curios here? Is that what we're... Because that's that's interesting because he's oftentimes called curios in the, the New Testament Koine Greek. And the thing that's interesting about that that causes confusion... Yep. Curios. Well, the thing that's interesting that causes confusion is when you look at the Septuagint. Whoever wrote the Septuagint, I got an idea who it was. They decided to use this word Kyrios in place of Yahweh. If we, if we used some kind of linguistic logic, we would have literally, we would have to see here, uh, Yahweh said, instead of Jesus. And there you, now you get into people being able to argue that Jesus is Yahweh, as opposed to he is the agent of, and I guess you have to ignore, or you got to do a lot of the uh, the mental verbal gymnastics to try to somehow get around the fact that he clearly made statements indicating that they, they weren't the same person, but he literally had the same mind. He had his mind. He was his son. He spoke all of his words, Yahweh's words words. He was his agent. He was his Messiah, his lamb, but not him. And he makes this clear. I'm not as great as the father. The father's greater than me. All right. Now, if, if that's true, and they are exactly the same person, now we've got a schizophrenic we're dealing with. So he goes on after the let's not offend these little ones to if your your brother offend these to faith. So first off talking about children, then to your brother offending you, then to faith. Luke 17, 6, if you had the faith of grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine, whatever a sycamine tree is, be thou because it only appears here in Luke, the sycamine tree. Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. And he's actually mixing various ideas together that we find elsewhere. The mustard seed found in a parable in Matthew concerning the kingdom of heaven. Not faith, the kingdom of heaven. The sycamine found nowhere else. It's based on a trans an English transliteration from what may be a Greek transliteration. We have no idea what kind of tree we're talking about. What if it was like a little teeny tree? It was like nothing. Oh, that's a what? That's a little teeny tree. That's not that hard. Anyways, 
Uh, he, so he's mixing them together because there are statements from also from Matthew where he says, uh, you know, if you had faith, you would tell a mountain to be removed. That's a big deal. How do we know what a sycamine tree is? I would have to guess it's a, it's a very sizable tree, whatever it, it is it's based on. And you don't find really any sizable trees in Palestine. So he's really bopping around here from subject to subject to subject. What's interesting is probably not going over all of the different passages that he's supposed to be paralleling. But if we just looked at the parallel, for instance, of the children and, and offending children, we'd find it in uh, Matthew 18, and it actually follows a very logical, reasonable, coherent flow of content and context. You'd find it in Matthew 18, um, start, because children come to him, and then he uses the children as this object lesson concerning children and your faith and the kingdom and, and then offending children. It's very understandable. Here, not so much. Um, and, and then the uh, your brother trespassing against you. That actually is uh, it is found later in Matthew 18. So I guess he just picked uh, a few uh, passages that he liked and he squished them together. He didn't get um, 17, 1 and 2 correct. He flipped those around because those are actually Matthew 18, 6 and 7 in reverse order. And then this whole idea, like I said, I, I could reference the two different passages, but that's what he's doing. He's taking the, uh, the metaphor of a mustard seed actually found in a different parable, and then the metaphor in, uh, with a mountain found in a, I, I would rather say a platitude uh, than a parable, and just smushing those together, and then you have Luke 17.6, which again is just ricocheting from one topic to the next. Now I'll move straight forward to the unworthy servants, Luke 17, 7 through 10. This bothers me in so many ways. And I should probably give you just a couple of examples so that you can see the contrast, okay? I'm going to quickly read 17. 7 through 10, so you understand what it is that is supposedly being said here. Again, ricocheting off to another topic. Completely, completely different topic, you know? I mean, look, I'm going to be really honest with you. If I was around somebody who was ricocheting to these different topics the way that it, it, it's being done, in Luke, completely different topics. I would be wondering to myself if they were mentally sound. Or I would be listening and watching for them to be exhibiting the telltale signs of somebody who is coked up because they can't keep a reasonable, coherent, logical thought and train of thought in their head and articulate them. Starting in verse 7, which of you, by the way, uh, uh, this, this is only to be found here. It's the same with um, the, uh, the grain of mustard seed saying to the sycamine tree, it's only to be found in Luke 17. This is only to be found in Luke 17. 7 through 10. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. Trow. Unbel you know, this is really archaic language for you King James only people. Well, you should educate yourself. 
All right. Well, look, the language back when the King James Version was written, the language and those words that they used were not the same as the language that was being used even a few decades before that. It's all arbitrary. So you can spend all the time you want looking through all of your old archaic dictionaries so you can understand this old archaic translation. For what? What are you putting all of that time into? Just so you can understand the language, the arbitrary language that they used at that time, which had been altered from the language they spoke only a few decades before. So it's not okay, those people who say, yeah, well, you come to all these words that are completely not known and weird and bizarre. Well, you need to educate yourself. You need to, what they're saying is you need to spend all of this time looking into words that are simply just as uh, thin, empty, and meaningless and arbitrary um, today as they were back then, but you just simply don't have them uh, available in, in, in your current vocabulary. Um, it's supposed to be based on dekeo in the Greek, and it's translated as think sometimes seemed sometimes, thought sometimes, suppose sometimes, accounted, pleased, suppose, supposing, thinketh, pleasure, reputation. Oh yeah, and one time as trow. Give me a break. So, I, he's supposed to be saying, do you thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. Is that so hard? Because they use think and suppose a bunch of times, but not there, I trow not. I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which are commanded you, say, he's telling them, now, when you've done everything that's commanded of you, you should say, we are unprofitable servants. <laughs> we, we have done that which was our duty to do. And then take a whip, and strip off your shirt and beat yourself in the back and say a hundred Hail Marys. Nah, he didn't say that. But it would actually logically follow if he did. So just keep in mind in Luke 17, he's supposedly saying that if you do everything that is asked of you, you should not consider yourself a good servant worthy of reward. But you need to somehow, you know, exercise some self-deprecation <laughs> and not, not expecting reward. Now, I could show you contrasts, stark black and white contrasts in other Gospels in Matthew. <clears throat> but maybe it would have more weight if I literally showed it to you in Luke. And of course, we haven't gotten to this yet. But it's Luke 19. It's the parable of the man who went, a nobleman who went to a far country. And he gave to his servants um, 10 pounds. Here it's, it's using pounds. Different translations use different monetary uh, figures, denominations, or things. And um, the thing is, what happens with these servants... I don't really want to go too far into this because I'm going to be looking at it later. The whole point is, when he sees what certain servants did, let's go to like 1917, he did what he told him to do with the money that he gave him. He told them to occupy, uh, do business. Here's uh, money, do business while I'm gone. Okay, 1917, he said to him, Oh, well, thou good servant, because you have been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. You see, and this continues, the second came, thy pound hath gained five pounds. He said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. Behold thy pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin. So this was the last one. And he didn't do anything with the pound, and so he was punished. 
reward and punishment. So when those servants actually did what he told them to do in that parable, just two chapters in front, they're rewarded. The master doesn't come back and say, did you do what I asked? And they say, well, yes, we, we did. We, we, and we actually, because we did what you asked, it was profitable. Well, the same thing here. If a servant does what he's asked in, in Luke 17, those verses I just read, that is profitable to the master. That is good. And it is worthy of reward, even if that reward is at a boy. But for some reason, according to Luke, he's telling him, you shouldn't expect even an attaboy. You should be self-depreciating. And say, well, I only did what he told me to do, so I, 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 I shouldn't pat myself on the back. I shouldn't expect anything. But that actually goes against the law and the prophets, because if Israel and Judah had done what they were expected to do, none of the horrors that we see befalling them, that we even experience to this day, would have ever befallen them, or still be befalling us today. So that just doesn't follow. The interesting thing about Jesus cleanses ten leopards, uh, lepers, <laughs> he did not cleanse any leopards that I'm aware of. Luke 17, 11 through 19 First off, it, it, it is only found in Luke, this account of him cleansing the ten lepers. But what's even more interesting about it is this. So it says that, um, it says that he was going, now, and these things could definitely, and they should, again, definitely be pointed out where they say he is going to, because there are disparities from gospel to gospel. Anyways, it says he's he passing through the midst of S Samaria and Galilee, or Shumran and the Galil. And then he sa it says he entered a certain village, and there were these ten lepers, right? And it said that they lifted up their voices, and they said, have mercy on us. When he saw them, um, he told them, go show yourselves to the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed on their way. On their way to show themselves to the priest, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that they was healed, he turned back with a loud voice and glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Luke makes it abundantly clear throughout Luke which you will not find in any other gospel, how much we are, the, the reader, is to regard the Samaritan as the, they are the, the misunderstood ones. They're, they're really good. We just don't understand them. I mean, look, look at these accounts. It was the Samaritan leper who came back and, and gave glory to God, the Samaritan. Just like uh, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, only found in Luke as well, the son of Aaron, the Kenim, didn't offer the poor man any help on the road. The Luim, the sons of Levi, he didn't offer the man any help on the road. It was the Samaritan. You see, you're misjudging the Samaritan. The Samaritan's good. And then again, he says, Who came back to worship him and glorify God? The Samaritan. Again, only found in Luke. Now, I would have to be suspicious after seeing, for instance, the parable of the Good Samaritan, only found in Luke, and then this account of the ten lepers, where the one glorifying God and giving great thanks and being, you know, so grateful, is a Samaritan. I would have to start thinking that maybe Luke is up to something, trying to get us to reconsider our thoughts on Samaritans, even though we see, for instance, the Samaritans in some of the last accounts we have of the Old Testament, the Samaritans being the chief 
factors in trying to halt the remnant of Judah coming back from Babel from building the Beit Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, and the walls of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It was the Samaritans. What was the problem? I've told you this before, but it bears repeating. The problem was they were not children of Jacob. That was the problem. They weren't children of Jacob. And they came and they told the remnant of Judah who came back to build Jerusalem. They said, your God is our God. We worship, we worship your God. We, we want to do this with you. And the children of Judah said, great, but it's only for us to do. We are the children of Jacob and the covenants were between the children of Jacob and Yahweh. They didn't insult them. They didn't call them names. They didn't imply anything. They simply said, how wonderful that is that uh, he is your God. That is, is good to hear. Thank you. But you can't do this with us. This is not for you to do with us. The covenant is between Yahweh and the children of Jacob. Did the Samaritans say, Ah, oh, we understand. We understand. Um, you know, thank you for being, uh, kind and courteous to us. And, uh, though we get that, how a covenant works and, uh, and that it is this, uh, covenant concerning the Beats Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, and, uh, certain other things are specifically just between Yahweh and the children of Jacob, Israel. Um, We'll be over here if you if you need anything, let us know. Because you know, your God is our God, and so we we certainly would like to be supportive of his people when they're doing his will, specifically. Nope, they didn't say that. They did not say that. They were petulant towards them for pointing out an obvious truth. And they did everything they could to not only stop their efforts at building, but to try to murder those who were their leaders. That's the Samaritans. But Luke is convincing us that we've got them all wrong. We've entirely misunderstood these Samaritans. Um, and we need to just take another look. We need to probably forget all about uh, what they are like and the references to these people, these mixed peoples that were brought in from all over the place, from our different enemies, Asher in the one case and Babel in another uh, case. I don't think uh, actually Maddie or Paris brought in any of them. They just, um, they they were already existing there for quite some time. They they just, I think, were content to let things, you know, continue as, as it was because I'm sure they were extracting tribute from you know, the Samaritans. And by that point in time, the Samaritans probably kind of had that uh, place on lockdown. Anyways, so the last part of this, which is just, um, it's just terrible. It's all, it's just awful. In Matthew 24 and 25, the story goes that they were in, uh, they were at the Beit Yahweh. People keep calling it the temple, but if you check it in the Old Testament, it's called Beit Yahweh, the house of Yahweh. We don't know that it, and in fact, if you read the descriptions about it in the Old Testament, nothing about it and the descriptions match the, the Masonic, creepy, cultish temple, uh, temple that they try to convince us is what the temple was like. Okay. The Beit Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, was simply a house that Yahweh agreed to because David wanted, his servant David wanted so badly to build him an actual house instead of the tabernacle, which he had dwelt in for a very long time amongst Israel for centuries. It was simply him allowing it. It wasn't anything he asked for or commanded. He simply allowed it. And the descriptions of it are 
far different, far different than what they try to convince us that it would have looked like all made out of uh, stone and hard materials as opposed to all of the wood, uh, combinations of wood and masonry that are described in the Old Testament. There was so much wood used in here. That's why that there were literally teams of men. We see this today where lumberjacks will go out into remote areas and they will fell certain amounts of trees and, you know, get them moved from one place to the other so that, you know, certain things could be done. This happened over in a very long period of time. So all of this was it's a very big project and it involved a lot of wood. A lot of wood. And there were actually stonemasons that were involved in it too, sure. But the the majority uh, of the structure of this Beatsia way was wood. Ah, did I get you? It was wood. So anyways, the story in Matthew 24 and 5 goes that they were at the this beats Yahweh and it, and you can imagine sure there were there were a lot of things um, all around it and it probably was decked with ornate types of stone marble things like that that doesn't take away just how much lumber was involved in all of these structures there were um, in it all around it there were things that were actually forged from metals as per the descriptions we find in the Old Testament. I'm not saying there's not. I'm saying that there was a huge amount of lumber employed in the building of the Beats Yahweh and many other buildings around it. And I don't care if you take Palestine and Lebanon and you want to fantasize that great trees once grew in Lebanon or northern Palestine. You still don't have the just the you don't really have the amount of <laughs> the environment or the amount of great trees that you would need for all of the projects that are described in the Old Testament, including the Beats Yahweh, the house of Yahweh. Anyways, in Matthew 24, they're at Beats Yahweh, which had all kinds of buildings all around it, and his disciples are pointing out, because it was probably a... When you went to Jerusalem and you went to Beats Yahweh, it was probably just an amazing experience to see these structures. Now, when I come across beautiful structures that we've built, they're, they're like a work of art. Just them, the structures in and of themselves... Just a few, day, a few days ago when I was in the UP, I was in a town called Manistique. And Manistique has what they call a water tower. It's about 130-something feet tall. It is, I believe the diameter is 30-something feet, maybe less diameter. I think it's 30 feet five feet diameter or 38 and it's this beautiful structure it is um it's all lined with brick it's octagonal uh all red brick on the outside with um ornate carved limestone at the bottom uh, for the lentil and the top there are corbels and there appears to be a welded steel dome roof on this it's quite a sight, and it has windows both below and above. You can check this out. The The official story for it just is nonsense. But it was a beautiful thing. In fact, I stopped so I could look closely at it, and I took a number of pictures of it too. And then I went and looked up, you know, and its story and everything. A beautiful building. And probably not even as beautiful a structure as the so-called water towers in many other places that I've seen. But still, nonetheless, it's beautiful. And that's what they're looking at. You get around these these buildings, and they're just... They're awe-inspiring, some of them. They're beautiful, wonderful works. And I would imagine that's what they're looking at. 
they're with him and they're like pointing out these things. Hey, have you seen this? Did you get a look at this? They're pointing these things out because they were probably absolutely magnificent, beautiful buildings. And that's when he said to them, he said, pretty soon there's not going to be one structure left here standing. Not one stone on the other. But yet, what, they they think that the the thing they call the Temple Mount, that doesn't count. Even though that's full of stones, that doesn't count. <laughs> he just meant everything from the, uh, he just meant everything from the mount at the top there, up. He wasn't talking about those. <laughs> Even though he did clearly say there would not be one stone upon another that was left. It was all going to be leveled. He was prophesying. It's, this is going to be gone soon. And it must have been a heck of a thing to see. All these buildings and structures and, you know, because we're capable of so much when we're not taxed to oblivion and made sick like we are today by our enemies we're capable of so much it must have been amazing to look at probably full of ornate carvings corbels and um relief carvings in granite marble uh, marble um probably you know ornate woodwork it, glass stained glass probably was beautiful it and all the buildings around it were probably beautiful and they were i'm sure all of them were, were marveling because they didn't get there that often i'm sure now if this were in palestine and this was all in the jerusalem the al quds they called jerusalem and palestine there'd be no reason why they couldn't have popped in there every now and then, and I mean, it only took somebody on a sick, lame horse about seven days to get from the most northern to the most southern tip of that place, you know? But you can tell they did not get there very often, and they were just awestruck, inspired by what they were seeing. And he tells them that everything you see here is coming down. And they were distraught. They were very distraught. They did not realize that that's how things were going to go. They follow him out of there. And this is what they call the Olivet Discourse. Because they're asking, what? Because to think of the destruction of all of that, obviously they put two and two together and they thought there's going to be a destruction of our culture and our, our society. And this was very, very troubling to them. They followed him out and they asked, where, when, when's this going to happen? When's this going to be? And then he gives them a, quite a long discourse that follows the rest of Matthew 24 to 25. What we are supposed to have in Luke 17, 20 through 37 is, uh, it's supposed to be a parallel of this. It, um, it doesn't really... Uh, follow consistent order with Matthew and uh, 24 and 25. And Matthew 24 and, and 25 are way too long for me to read right now. What I'll do is I'll, I'll just go through here these, these remaining verses in Luke that make up the, the Lukean version of the Olivet Discourse. And I'll tell you whether or not they can even be found as a cross-reference in Matthew 24 or 25 and where. And I will end it off with that, okay? Now, the first bizarre thing is, it starts out in 1720, he's talking to the Pharisees. Now, in Matthew 24 and 25, he's not with the, the Pharisees, he's with his, his inner circle of men, okay? That's it, not with throngs of people, he's with his just his inner circle. He's teaching these things, too, in Matthew 24 and 25. Luke 17, 20 and 21 says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither sh uh, shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. 
which is just a really cryptic statement, speaking to the Pharisees. There is no cross-reference for this at all, except for the uh, nor shall they say low here or low there. You can cross-reference that to Matthew 24, verses 23 and 28. This is part of a far more coherent dissertation in Matthew 24. The next verse, and he said unto the disciples, The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you shall not see it. That is not from Matthew 24. That's actually taken from Matthew 9, 15. That is a serious chronological problem. And then Luke 17, 23, And they shall say to you, See here or see there, Go not after them, nor follow them. Now we're popped back over to cross-reference Matthew 24, 23 through 26. Then Luke 17, 24, For as the lightning that lighten, lighteneth uh, out of the one part of heaven, you need to look that up in the dictionary, lighteneth out of one part of uh, under heaven shines unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. That from Matthew 24 and verse 27. Not the man be in his day. In, in Matthew 24, 27, he actually says, For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And I'm actually thinking that here we're looking at, what are we looking at? The Koine work, yeah, word Perusia. It is Perusia. And um, what are we looking at here? Just kind of wondering. I'm going to make you uh, go on this adventure with me. So shall the Son of Man be also in his day. Yeah, no Perusia. There's a guy who actually did a whole study on that word Perusia and what it means. He's not even saying that in Luke 17. And in Matthew, you don't have to deal with the word lighteneth. But I digress. So in Luke 17, 25, But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. This is actually found in a, a number of different places in Matthew. Matthew 16, 21, 17, 22, where he's prophesying about himself. Just interjected in here. It's just interjected. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now that could be cross-referenced to Matthew 24, 37 through 39. At least we're keeping somewhat of a chronological consistency where it's not dodging way back to early Matthew 24. Now, in Luke 17, 28, likewise also in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. There is no cross-reference to this. He does not say that in Matthew or any other gospel in that way. Luke 17, 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. From Matthew 24, 27, and from Matthew 26, 64, uh, now Luke 17, 30, when he says, so the Son of Man be revealed. Maybe, maybe, oh, not revealed, apocalypto. Um, sorry. <laughs> it is, it's apocalypto. So he's not using perusia, it's, a, it's apocalypto. Apocalypse is... Um, it's a whole interesting term in and of itself, and I guess you could spend a lot of time in Luke, a gospel account that does not harmonize with Matthew. And if it doesn't harmonize with Matthew, it doesn't harmonize with Mark. And John doesn't harmonize with any of them. But you know what? Feel free. Be my guest. Spend all the time you want to in it. Um. All right. So in 1731, in that day, which he, um, he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. He that is in the field, let him like, likewise not return back. Now, this is cross-reference to Matthew 
24, 17 through 21. There's a lot more content to it, though, in Matthew. There's a lot more content. I highly recommend reading the Olivet Discourse as it is in Matthew 24 and 25. And, and I also highly recommend ignoring Luke 17 because it, it isn't complimentary. It's confusing. And then Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. I guess the returning back thing with Lot's wife. Uh, yeah, I'm, I really don't believe that she turned into a pillow of salt, as Archie Bunker would say. I don't believe she turned into anything of salt. That wording is really strange, as a matter of fact, concerning it. But anyways, so Luke 17, 33, whoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. That's a wonderful um, a truth and platitude, is it not? But the problem is we don't find that in Matthew 24 whatsoever. We actually find the cross-reference being in Matthew 16, 25 in a completely different context concerning uh, the disciples taking up their cross and following after him. Totally different. Luke 17, 34, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, I hope not. And the one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Um, Luke 17, 35, Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. 17, 36, Two men shall be in the field, one taken, and one left. That is, again, from Matthew 24 and 40 through 41. So the verses that are parallel, first off, they're not worded the same. I'm not just giving you verses from Luke. They are worded exactly the same. They're just in different spots. There are, as I just illustrated to you, where you'll find parousia in the version of Matthew. You won't find that in Luke. They're not worded the same. They are worded different. And that matters. And then finally with Luke 17, 37, And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? <laughs> where? What? What? <laughs> You told us so many weird things. Where? <laughs> and he said to them, Wheresoever the body is, there will the eager, eag eagles be gathered together. Um, now you do actually have something similar to that. Matthew twenty four twenty eight. Okay, and that's actually out of chronological order because we just saw him referring to verses far in front of the 24 28 now this actually goes back to a verse that appears to be a parallel in luke for as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west so shall the coming the parousia very interesting term which we don't find there in luke so will the coming of the son of man be and then he goes on to luke doesn't miss a beat in or in Matthew, not Luke. In Matthew, doesn't miss a beat and says, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. That's literally how it ends in Luke. When they say, Where, Lord, where? And he answered, uh, Wherever the the body is. There will the eagles be gathered together. Now, that's 49.83 in Luke. I'm sure it's also right. 40, no, it's 44. It's actually Toma in Matthew, the carcass. It is P-T-O-M-A. I'm giving you not the Greek letters. Uh, you know, we basically got um, Pi, Tau, Omega, Mu, Alpha. Okay, Toma which I guess you wouldn't pronounce the P. Toma is carcass in Matthew 24, 28. And then we have Soma, which is typically translated, right? Let's see. Body, bodies, slaves. Soma, that's really weird because that's usually translated soul, body. It, in Just in other contexts, that's... I actually got taken by surprise there a little bit. But it certainly is a very different word. No, body, 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 body. See, now you can point that out and you can say, see, he made a mistake there. I certainly did. Um, and the patoma 
I guess Soma and Potoma are not all that different because in uh, as we see we've got it in um, in as bodies dead and carcass and corpse um, you would have to think that the root would be Oma if there was a root to these two different things that the PT in the one instance and the S in the other would be signaling a difference but that's enough of a difference for me I'm pretty sure he refers to this same word um, ayetos, which they translate as eagles in both. I know that actually that doesn't really matter unless he was saying something like, you know, eagles in one and cows in the other, which that wouldn't be that weird from what we've seen uh, of Luke so far. But the whole point is this. Not only does the, everything we've seen up till now, and, and it's gone on for chapters now, chapters and chapters of what's supposed to be a monologue or dissertation to many people in many ways uh, hitting many subjects just as I said ricocheting like a pinball in a pinball machine it's he's going here he's going there he's going left he's going right and then we get to what is supposed to be um, a complement to the Olivet Discourse and I posit to you there's nothing complimentary about it mm. so fortunately <laughs> fortunately there's there's only about seven chapters left but it's that bad I you know I would really think after looking at at all of the disparities here that no self-respecting Bible teacher could just pull from all of these different Gospels and have, without being embarrassed, if they had a, a soul, because of how radically different just Luke and Matthew are. Not different and, well, you know, they're complementary. Of course they're different because, you know, one person's going to write something one way and another person's going to write something the other way and they'll have different perspectives of course and you do have to consider that no we're not talking about that we're talking about things that are clearly but let me give you an example okay let's say we are talking about a very important historical character and whether the one got um everything eyewitness as we would see Matthew or who is supposed to be also known as Louis and we're gonna look at that at some point in time too but Matthew will say that he got his account from being an eyewitness and Luke got his through like secondhand sources and so on okay if that were the case they would certainly have a different writing style they may both have thought that certain features of his ministry were more important to address or to expand on than others. That's true as well. What I wouldn't expect to find, and this is the problem, had it been two different writers that were, they were both honest and they were coming at this from a very honest place, especially if this was supposed to, especially if both books were supposed to be inspired. Here's what I wouldn't expect to find, is two accounts that so closely follow the same structure, but with so many contradictions and disparities between the two. When I see that, I smell a rat. They could be they could be two accounts that were really close and had some variations to them. Fine. We, you'll actually find that when you read the books of first and second Samuel and then you read the books of like first Chronicles. You'll find that. And you can find that with other accounts too. There are parallel accounts uh, from different books in the Bible. You'll find that with um, between Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, you'll find parallels in there. But they are paralleling the same accounts. 
in, in somewhat different ways. We're not talking about two accounts that are both supposed to be okay, they're both acceptable enough to where they were both included in the canon of Scripture, yet they are so at odds with one another in so many ways that you can't possibly either have a good mind or a good heart and accept both of them. One of them's got to go. And I'm not saying that makes Luke entirely useless, because even things that were purposely written to deceive us have their uses, but we have to identify what they are before we can use them for what they are. If we, if we are using it as a, a good and proper and, and trustworthy account, we are deceiving ourselves and we're deceiving others and we're not getting further down the road. If we look at it as an account that was likely written and passed off in certain circles at certain times to give us the wrong idea about things like for instance the Samaritans we must have just misjudged them they sound a lot like another people who uh, uh, not too many people liked very much and they kept getting kicked out but they're just misunderstood it's not their behavior or the fact that um, they are at enmity with us simply because we are the people that are in covenant with Yahweh through our fathers, our direct blood lineage. They're just misunderstood. So there's always going to be a problem with accepting something that um, should not be accepted as truth and using that as a true, good, factual source. So with that, I'll end and uh, I'll see you in the next one.